I suck at jujitsu. How do I suck less? Hey everybody, this is Josh McKinney, and I just want to welcome you to the newest episode of the I Suck at Jiu-Jitsu show. So, first off, I just wanted to, to thank you guys for checking out last week's episode. I had a lot of people um, give me feedback on the episode, and um, had a lot of people reach out about helping finish the course that we were doing. And so... Um, we can talk a little more about that maybe in the outro of this episode, uh, but um, just kind of wanted to get into today's episode. I have a really good one for you, a little longer than we uh, typically do. I don't know. We've been doing more 90-minute interviews, um, but it is, a, a again, a 90-minute interview. It's in person, and it is with the head coaches, the uh, owners of Revive Jiu-Jitsu. I tell you guys about it all the time. Um, it's probably pretty infamous for podcast listeners um, for, you know, tough training. And you'll hear just in the first couple minutes how we talk to each other um, about training with uh, the goal of trying to injure each other. And uh, you guys will see what I mean about about that intensity and why I love going there. Um, but that being said, we are going to have in the middle of the interview, we're going to have um, a... Um, a, a deal for you on Nick Sanders' most recent instructional, and so um, you guys will really like you guys will like what I have to what I have to tell you on the commercial today. Um, but besides that, I think you guys are really going to enjoy this conversation. It's just a, a really big range. We went in with the idea that we were going to just talk kind of competition and competition stories, but we really do put a lot of focus into the evolution of jujitsu not like man jujitsu is so different and we're upset about it but jujitsu is so different and this is how we deal with that as people that have trained for um all of us have trained over 15 years and so um and in different areas too and so uh, we really do have a lot of perspective when it comes to uh where jujitsu is now and where it was 15 years ago and again just how to deal with that as a coach and um even a student and so uh, i think you guys are really going to like today's episode i won't ramble on too much uh let's go ahead and get into today's interview with junior and nick Been recording the whole time. All right, Nick Junior, how are you guys doing today? Doing good, man. I'm doing great. Yeah. yeah. Feel like since I've been on dad duty, um, haven't been haven't been around very often. Haven't seen you guys a lot. Missed you guys. Yeah, he's been dodging the train. Yeah, we miss you, man. I can't wait to beat you up. Yeah, I know you can't. Speaking of, like, uh, um, remember when you were like. Oh, Josh, Josh, you should have a baby. It would yeah. be so much fun. You would love it. That was messed up, dude. <laughs> I remember when you tore my groin. My baby was just born. <laughs> it was a long play. That was the long yeah. play. <laughs> I couldn't sleep for months. And I went to train a watch, and I wanted to roll light, and you did a crazy knee cut. And it hurt me. So I have always like... Payback's coming. I feel like when it comes to injuries... It's like you, oh, you tucked your chin in the rear naked choke and your chin got hurt, right? It's like you tried to reverse De La Hiva, my knee cut. Um, no, that know. seems like it's your problem. You know, that seems like it's not on me. Man, I don't know. I don't know. But you got you to have respect for the groin area. Yeah. Man. Dude, his, it toughened his groin up. The, the other one got blown out like a week later. Yeah. <laughs> so then, Before. therefore, <laughs> he just has a weak groin. Think so? Yeah. Like if... You know, if you got an injury on both sides, it's probably just muscular weakness. The first time I had a surgery, a couple of days before that, I went there to drill. The second time, I just had a baby, and I went there to train light. Bro, you're not sleeping well that. at night, and you're going to come back to revive, and I will hurt you. <laughs> <laughs> and Nick's going to help me, and you're going to take your pants off again. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 
Yeah. Yep. That was, yeah, that, you know, I don't, I never bring up that Nick almost ended my career with almost. an overhead sweep. Well, I was trying you know? to get submitted. And then as, <laughs> as soon guy. as, as soon as my shoulder just, just is destroyed, he's like, let's get his pants off. Yeah. You know, it'll yeah. help him. He's Man. in shock. Restrictive clothing. You got to take, you got to re- loosen the restrictive clothing. That's all it was. I was new here. I was like, man, it's how Americans are crazy. That's <laughs> <laughs> how we do it in St. Louis. <laughs> we don't do that in Brazil. Somebody gets hurt to take their pants off. That's Somebody dangerous. gets hurt in Brazil, you just roll them outside. Yeah, you throw, throw them, them the outside. Yeah, yeah, it's the yeah. best way to do it. You probably don't have to worry about getting sued, though, in Brazil. No, you know? nobody sues anybody. In America, you got to worry about that, dude. You Americans are crazy. That is true. So on that topic, I thought the best place that we could start this podcast, and there's so many places we could start, would be, is jiu-jitsu American or Brazilian? Oh, wow. Ooh, man, that's a rough one. Wow. wow. Backstory for everybody who doesn't know, Junior and I are business partners. <laughs> yeah, he's Brazilian, I'm American. Well, but ju- they were also- business partners <laughs> until this conversation. But I will say this, Junior is now an American citizen. I so am American. So you're he, teaching he, American jiu-jitsu? I don't know. If you I think we just teach jiu-jitsu, jiu-jitsu, right? Teach jiu-jitsu, yeah. yeah. Oh, come on. I you call know, bra- like a lot of people call my gym you asking for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu when they're white belt. And then they start training, they get they get the blue belt, purple belt, and they hear Nick Sanders talking. They're like, Guess what? I'm doing American Jiu Jitsu now. <laughs> and they keep doing the same thing. I don't know what I'm doing anymore. You know? Like uh, my coffee, my revived coffee. It's it's from my dad's farm in Brazil. Nick Sand already calls this American coffee. <laughs> Only when I sold to veterans. Was roasted in America. Yeah. To that's veterans, true. Yeah. It is roasted in America. It's all about so, how you phrase it. Man, that's we'll have a <laughs> that's a that's a pretty that's a pretty racy topic right there. Yeah. I'm glad we got into revive coffee already. You know, it was like when I interviewed Robert Arias and he kept name dropping Arias Bros Jiu Jitsu oh, yeah. on me. You gotta put the plugs in. You got to. You so got let's let's in. let's open up with what what is revive coffee? Because I was talking to my father in law, trying to explain to him why it is different, and he was like, "What do you mean? I don't I don't understand." So what makes what makes the green coffee um, what makes it different? So I started uh, the coffee business because of my dad. He does like commodity coffee, normal coffee. You get like every bean out of the tree. Like green beans, ripe beans, bad beans, fungus, or everything on that tree, they rip out of that tree. They dry in the floor with animals walking over it. Don't, they don't care. And they dry the coffee, sell it, comes to Central America, anywhere. There's a lot of people doing specialty coffee now. It's a huge movement. They also pay better the farmers for this type of coffee. It's where you only get the ripe, the best cherries. You dry them in a raised bed and... Um, you send to another country or in Brazil and people pay better for that and taste better. You guys know, you guys tried mm-hmm. this coffee. And uh, I spoke to one of my dad's neighbor and he was doing that type of coffee. He's like, you should convince your daddy, maybe teach him. So I came to, back to America and like, I want to do this. I want to help my father. And I got hooked up with the guys up shot in St. Charles and they were great. They taught me a lot. So I was like, oh, I'm going to get some really good coffee and bring to America. And that's how... What I did, I got this container, like a lot of coffee, you know, to, and I'm selling coffee to roasters or selling at the gym for my friends, and I love the coffee business, you know. And I will, as much as I love to trash talk you, I will say that that coffee is substantially better than really any like coffee it. that I've had, you know, is uh, just always is, it is a, it feels like a different product when you drink coffee that is... I guess it's ripe is yeah. is the difference. Um, and it's not over roasted because it's you're able to to not have to roast it so much because it's ripe. Um, but yeah, absolutely love the revive coffee. It's because it's roasted in America. It's That's because right. they yeah. roast I've never had it. I've it, do you have any batches that are roasted in Brazil so we can compare them? I'll bring some next time I come. Do they even can they even roast coffee in Brazil? They they can, yeah. Not as good as America. Cuz we're the best. Like America's the best. Like the jiu-jitsu, right? Yeah, like the jiu-jitsu. <laughs> like, I will say this, I started off 
with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And the only reason why I say American Jiu Jitsu is kind of piss off some of the Brazilians. <laughs> I know. And, that, and that's the reason why is because I was getting screwed over at tournaments. You know, I was always losing these ref decisions. So it's like, yeah, whatever. But I, I in reality, it's it's just Jiu Jitsu to me. That's that's what it is. You know what I found is one of the best ways to win referees' decisions in the IBJJF is to put AJJ on the back of your gi. You know, so. you know, I don't know. Anytime me and anytime Nick is in a match and I'm coaching him and the score is tied, I'm always yelling, "You're down by an advantage, Nick. You're down by an advantage." <laughs> you should do that, yeah, because the only way to to win refs' decision is to win by points. That's that's how mm-hmm. it is, or submission. Yeah, I so, I would I would agree with that. You can't leave it like oh man, especially the big tournaments. You mm-hmm. go against a, a Brazilian who big name out there, you're gonna lose every single time. It's unfortunate, but it is what it is. Yeah, some of the old school guys always gets the referee decision, right? Also, yeah. if you fight Lovato, they're gonna give it to him if he's yeah, because he's famous. Yeah, yeah. that's I that. against other Brazilians too. The twice I I was sh- I think I was sure I won. And the referee gave to the guy, so it's pretty upset. You know, and I don't want to claim that there is anything nefarious that goes on, but I will say, you know, a, a great highlight, I think, from uh, the tag team perspective, um, all three of us being uh, coaches on tag team, was us winning the first St. Louis Open. Um, because for us, it was like there are a lot of teams that were – you know, going for the team title. It was the first time they're doing it in our city. And we definitely were like, we want to we wanna win this. We want to show out. And um, there was actually a point when I was, I was coaching somebody and there were two points they should have gotten. And I yell, you know, I even call the referee professor, you know, nothing. Play, I'm not getting anything, part. trying to, you know, trying to do it. And then I literally say, Junior, say what I said in Portuguese. And he said it. And I assume that's what he said. He might have just been like, hey, I, you know, this is my buddy. I don't know what he said. <laughs> but uh, then the ref gave us the two points. And so there's something there. I, I always yeah, try to throw out there. there when there's an advantage. I'm like, hey, ref, advantage. Advantage. Just so make sure they Professor, advantage. <laughs> But that was a good day. We yeah, we won. Yeah, our team did great, and you got the the trophies. I revive. You can't touch it. Got well, the st- trophies. Before you calling me to get the trophies. And then like, the same thing, Kansas City Open. We won that one too on the very last match of the day. Um, one of Devin's purple belts, I think, won the whole thing on the very last oh, match in man. the absolute. It was a featherweight. Where you were there, right? Yeah. I yeah. Was it was there. like if he was like a featherweight or a lightweight, it'd be like an ultra heavy. In the finals. Of the absolute, it was awesome. Have you guys ever, until now, have you guys ever been part of a team that wins, wins opens? You know, wins the no the team trophy. Uh, tag I, team yeah, yeah trophy. I've never. I mean, when it was me and Kyle, like we were never even competing for team trophies, and it's so much fun to uh, you know for every match to matter. You know, especially as a coach, when you're you know I'm coaching revive guys, you guys are coaching head nod guys. We're just who cares? We're just trying yeah, to get team points. Gonna, we're a team for real. <clears throat> and that's the cool thing about BJJF. I know a lot of people don't like BJJF, but it's so hard to win a team trophy or even like a tournament. You go like to any black belt division, is purple belt, adult, or even master, so tough. And see, a lot of people just give up and start talking bad yeah. about it. But. I, I hate like so. I, I'm pretty passionate about that. As much as I get pissed off at the IBJJF refs decisions, mm-hmm. they're still the number one organization in the world. Everybody's on this like no gi versus gi, ADCC versus IBJJF. Like honestly, we wouldn't have um, the jujitsu popularity we have if it weren't for IBJJF, Naga, Grapplers Quest, <laughs> yeah. and those are some names you don't hear anymore. The the latter two, but. Like ADCC wasn't around. That wasn't like a. It was around, but it wasn't like a super big thing. You got the DVDs, you know, two mm-hmm. months later. The ones really pushing grappling in America was Naga and Grapplers Quest. Those were huge um, for the American scene. And then when IBJJF came here in 07, because before that we were all watching at the Tajika Tennis Club where they had the Worlds, and you know, it was like, oh man, like we everybody wanted to go down there and compete. When they moved it to America, I feel like jujitsu just 
like really, really, really exploded. Mm-hmm. And then they started doing the Nogi tournaments. But um, yeah, I get I I don't like when people bash on the IBJJF for as much as they suck for a lot of things. They're still the best organization with the best grapplers in the world. Nobody that opinion. wins IBJJF stuff bashes the IBJJF. No, it's always people that lose. Yeah, lose or don't do it because uh-huh. they're too scared or you know though they say stuff you know I don't know. I've well, been coaching for many years and I met a lot of guys and I coach a lot of guys that couldn't win IBJJF or couldn't win a match and they just start bad mouth you know gave up like oh I'm not doing this anymore let's yeah. go do a small tournament in town and you know the yeah, easy way out the saying is is like if you can't win a IBJJF or if you're not gonna get promoted to the next belt just start doing nogi <laughs> 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 and then you could just go do a you know a, a Fuji or an AGF and then you know the belts don't matter at that point I guess and yeah and when you see that like it you know not to not even to bash any other tournament. People always try to compare, oh, this tournament is going to take over. And I see different people, especially on Facebook, that are, like, pushing it. And these are, like, coaches of, like, big organizations that are like, yeah, the IBJJF is going down. It's going to be this or that. And they'll point out, they'll be like, look at this one tournament, this one weekend uh, every four months that draws almost a 1,000 competitors or draws a 1,000 competitors. Right. Like, bro... IBJJF has four tournaments in four countries this same weekend. You cannot tell. They, we are pulling, not the same. They're all pulling a thousand people. Mm-hmm. Every one of those tournaments has a thousand people. Like they're just were ADCC open, which is awesome. I'm glad they're starting to do it. I don't want to bash ADCC either. I'm glad there's a competition. I, I want mm-hmm. that. It's going to make the sport better overall. Um, they had 1,600 people at the Austin Open. That's like day two at the pans. Yeah. You know, like there's 5,000 competitors at the Worlds of the pans. So it's like, I'm glad they're there. I'm glad they're doing it. But the people that are saying, oh, ADCC is going to take over, IBJJF sucks, very short, very short sighted. And I think the more tournaments, the better because mm-hmm. um, it gets the word out. You get the, if you don't want to do an IBJJF or there's not one close to you on a particular weekend and ADCC is, go do it. That's awesome. I think that's great, I, and I really think it's silly that people are trying to make gi versus no gi or like ADCC versus IBJJF an actual thing. It's just silly. And on top of that, there is as a competitor, you know, I've we've all competed for a long time. I would argue that there is nothing more fun as a competitor than trying to be ranked in your age weight belt. Yeah. You know, and that's in oh, yeah. the only ranking system that is actually realistic is the IBJJF. Yes. Right. You really, you know, if you go win purple belt master four worlds, you know, you are probably in, you know, the, the best guy in your division at that age and at that belt. And uh, you just cannot say that with any other division. You know, like people will drive to whatever and be like, oh, I went to went to Naga Worlds, I'm a world champion. Like, yeah. no, you're not. Come yeah, on. I mean, people. Yeah. yeah but... You're a Naga World champion. Exactly. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, and getting to to kind of chase that has been so much fun. Do you guys have, you know, it doesn't even have to be 2023, but just over the last bit of time that we've been doing a lot of, of tournaments, do you have any highlights, Any anything that you think back to that like, oh, this was a really awesome thing? I Obviously for me, Brought up winning the St. Louis Open. I, as silly as it is, even though we've probably won bigger tournaments than that. Uh, oh, but that was the biggest for us. That's our hometown. Yeah. You know? that's mm-hmm. good. Nothing else matters when uh, they come into St. Louis. We got to win. We got to represent. I was going to compete. I was going to make my wife compete. I told my mom to put a white belt and go there and fight for us. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's fighting. People at my gym know. All you know? the points count, yeah. I, w- I went around my gym and asked guys, like, you want to compete? I'm going to help you get ready. If they say no, I told them, you're dead to me. Yeah, go yeah. train a head nod. Yeah, you yeah. Head <laughs> <laughs> Those guys do whatever they want, not here. <laughs> I think um, St. Louis Open was a good one, but I think the 2020, my, my, me personally, my 2020 tournament run, was awesome, and I think it's also awesome for Revive because we had we got like six Pan Am champions yeah. and a couple world champions just out of that one year, and it was our first full year being open. Um, so that 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 twenty twenty run, it was right after COVID. I think I had won the the Pans, both Gi and No Gi, got second at Master Worlds. 
um, one Nogi Worlds. Uh, that run was like, that was my best run. That, that was, was that run. was a really fun time to compete too because divisions were smaller, <laughs> but they were so elite. It was like, okay, maybe I would normally have a, a 10 to 16 guy division and I'm having eight to six guys, but these eight to six guys are the best oh, yeah. guys. And so it was really fun during, you know, I was doing a lot of competing too um, during um, like kind of through COVID and just getting to see those same faces. I fought Yago Souza twice and it was like, yeah, dang, dude. This, that that guy, yeah, that, this that is guy's crazy. Stud. Where's he at, by the way? What's he even doing? And he, you know, he hung his hat on beating me down a few times and was like, <laughs> I think. We got second know, at Pans the uh, Tynan. Tynan and, that and was then the that was the last time yeah. you saw him. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Maybe he. Gave up because he's dead. So Man. <laughs> probably doing American Jiu Jitsu. Yeah. American Jiu Jitsu somewhere you know? in Brazil. Uh, <laughs> I, no, yeah, he he barely lost to Tynan too. Mm -hmm. I think it was like he had advantage. his back in the end. One hook yeah. on something yeah. like that. Yeah, it was close. It was a good good match. Josh almost broke his leg. So. I don't remember that, <laughs> <laughs> I, but I like what you're saying. You know, yeah. I remember. I think back to also doing the, um, you know, for me a really special one was. I think it was 2022 Indianapolis Open, and it was because was it Indianapolis? Might have been Memphis. Um, regardless, it was the tournament that um, Watson competed Gi and Nogi and um, won his Nogi division. It was what, what, Indianapolis. It was Indy. Indianapolis. Yeah. Okay, so that one because you know at the time for us as a team, I think we had probably won Chicago Open, but like you know. We're just there. We're just there helping our boy Mark Vives yeah, out. Mark when we're, yeah, Mark tournament. It's like, you know, he's got such a huge presence of his team alone. Um, but, like, going to a, a, a place that we don't have any schools in the area. And um, I think I want to say we were – we had half the competitors as some of the bigger yes. schools. And we just – we came in. Um, I think I was injured um, – I think Junior was injured. I think I had probably tore his groin or something. That was and, probably after. And, <laughs> and so uh, we're not competing, and it's just like, hey, well, we're going to coach. We're going to coach every match. And as we were doing it, we really, we really stayed neck and neck and really were doing great in the team points. We ended up the next day when they did the white belt divisions, we had like – True. No, had yeah, we had two belts. white belts competing, and that was like that's the problem with not having any local schools is you won't get a lot of white belts yeah. to travel. And then we ended up losing by a couple points. We get second. As soon as we get second, Junior starts just roasting our guys like they worked <laughs> so hard, and he starts individually <laughs> pointing out like you did not stay for your open class. You know you suck yesterday, and, and you gotta let them know. You gotta let them yeah. know. Gotta that's, gotta, that's gotta toughen coach. them up. Somebody gotta tell them. Is this a good coach? But it's the fact that it's the fact that like that one we were so close. I really feel like for us it was like, oh, we can we can win in in any city, you know, if we just if we bring our team. Bring the crew. And so that was a super cool experience too. Is that what we're doing for Memphis? Because I'm starting to push it. Like yeah. Memphis open. I think yeah, I think right we're all doing Memphis, right? Yeah. I'm doing it. Yeah. Doing yeah. It. yeah. Watson yeah. just told me I just interviewed Watson and my dad, and Watson just said that he's doing Memphis. He wants to do no gi. gi. He wants to do no gi. Just, just tell both? him to do gi. He say he his arm is not that good anymore. Let him let it let him let him sacrifice himself. You for talk it. to him. He's your boy. Okay. Yeah, tell okay. him he's got to do gi too. Dude, first. he's uh, you're the Brazilian Kyle Watson. You're he's your boy. The ladies call me that. So. <laughs> 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 Some yeah, I'll talk to him. Maybe he'll listen to me this time. If yeah. he understands me, he listens to me. That's true. Most of the time, he doesn't understand me. He just nods his head. He does not yeah. listen to anybody. Yeah. He'll listen to me when I coach him, you know? Uh -huh. Sometimes, you know? Every every other, every every little bit, he will. Um, but yeah, he doesn't, uh, you know, he, he likes to he likes to follow his own path. Yeah. I think he I think he would do just fine. And with because his nogi game transfers well into his gi game, mm -hmm. like I don't think he'd have to worry about much with grips and whatnot. Yeah, he had a big surgery, so nah, yeah. nah, that's fine. He'll be fine. No, don't worry about that, bro. Yeah. Nick will be cranking to the arm. The day for his gi on, Nick, like <laughs> Jim yeah. that that gi. So Kyle Watson is the only person where, that I go against. <clears throat> well, I shouldn't say the only because when I go against you, Josh, I'm just like okay. Just don't let him get chest to chest connection. <laughs> yeah. If I go a junior, don't let him get dogfight. 
Yep. Or the uh, crazy dog. Don't pass. let him get my lapel. Yeah. Don't yeah. let him grab lapel. Kyle, it's don't let him body lock. Yeah. And the last time we trained together, no gi, I ended up body locked, and mm. it was miserable. He'll hurt your lower back. Yeah, he'll, yeah, it crushes you. I'm like, how is somebody so strong at this age? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always, I always like to see too, like you will lock him in some of the tightest stuff in the world, and he will just straight up not tap to it. Oh, man. He will just straight up eat it. That's and why he got the surgery. <laughs> <laughs> he's yeah. He was like, yeah, they they you know did an ultrasound on my elbow, and he's like, there's bone spurs in it, and there's this is torn and that's torn. Like, yeah, dude, maybe you should tap every once in a while. Like, oh, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> it doesn't hurt. Crazy guy. <laughs> Not anymore. It probably hurt in the beginning. He just yeah. fought through it. Now it just like locks out, so it doesn't bother him anymore. It got numb. So for you guys, um, are there any things? as uh, let's say as competitors first um but we can even expand to as coaches that over the last you know three plus years now of just competing a lot and getting our guys to compete a lot that you guys have learned that were like kind of big moments of like oh this seems to matter i didn't really realize or even just ways of train changing training or anything like that um so, I mean, one big thing I really realized is um, focus training is important. So, like, I made myself with lower belts or people I knew I can beat, I'd had, I would say I have to focus on certain positions or certain passes to get the live reps in. I know we talk about that every now and then. It's like it's a live rep. Going against black belts is just survive, you know, try, try to implement the game. So <clears throat> quality training um, and then – Man, when you want to be the best, you can't dodge hard rounds. <laughs> like you have to have hard rounds. That was those are the two big, in the training aspect, eye opening things. It's like, all right, I was training hard, but kind of just kind of you know, get it off round here or there, <clears throat> or wasn't really pushing myself, um, to like push the pace from the starting belt to the ending bell. Um, so when I started really taking it seriously again, it was that was one big one. Like push, 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 score last every round. I don't care if you're down by 10 points, score last. Mm -hmm. That's a big one. And then, um, you know, <clears throat> seeking out hard rounds. <clears throat> Excuse me. Those are the big ones that in the training field. And then training partners matter. Like, they matter so much. Me getting rounds in with, you know, a white belt just kind of floating around, that's not a quality round. That's a warm-up. Mm -hmm. So I have to be seeking out you, Matt Green, Kyle, Junior, Josh Uncle. Little Eric, like all these black belts, if I want to get better and be prepared for tournaments, I got to really push myself with them. And then in the tournament scene, um, you know, mental visualization was huge. Jeff, when he was in town, he got me on that. And so uh, I visualized before every tournament, you know, showing up to the tournament, <clears throat> doing my warm up, walking out to the bullpen, getting weighed in, going out to the mat winning all my matches, get my hand raised, and I just revert, I just visualize it over and over and over and over again. Um, so mental visual, visualization and mental prep was was huge. And then, um, man, just getting there, immersing myself into the into the environment. I like to get there like two or three hours early and just take in all the sounds, get all the nerves out, get a good warm-up in. And, and then also I would tell myself, this is probably the biggest thing for the actual competition was it's just another day. Mm -hmm. This is literally just like open mat. Like, if Lovato were to come to Revive tomorrow, I wouldn't be scared to roll with them. I'd just go roll with them, mm -hmm. right? And so um, when you don't refrain from going, like, giving it your all, and if you don't play too tight and you actually go out there and, and do it, you have much, much, much better results. I think that's the biggest ones I've learned. Man, oh, that's, that that's a lot of good stuff, bro. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with tournaments, I think, like, um, usually people – I think there's a lot of information nowadays. That's me. I think there's a lot of new things to do all the time. And I see a lot of my guys jumping around. They don't become, you know, great or anything. I try to get my game, like, just stick with some things I do well and make it better. Maybe add things that will connect close to what, I, what I'm already doing it. 
I think that that helped me a lot because I I changed my game a lot in the f- last few years. I used to be into being fast, try speed pass. It was a lightweight, way you know, 160. I'm 180 now. I'm a pretty strong guy, uh, <laughs> way bigger than Josh. <laughs> so I think that that's something that I think people, if you have a hard time with your jiu-jitsu, I think that will help you try to stick. Maybe with the game that your gym already does, what your gym does well, be great at that, you know. Another thing I see, guys that are like by coaching Nick in tournaments and I coach other guys that don't win, it's like if you have a game plan, I know what he wants to do. You go around and start telling him, or like, man, this guy's going to do this, stick with that. He listens and he's like, okay, that's the game. I'm going to win by doing that. He does, you know, he believes on his game and he gets it done. And I think that's a big thing, you know. Yeah, I think that's huge is like believing in your game. Like, um, <clears throat> My game plan in the finals at Panza when you were there coaching me uh, was to pull guard. And you're like, hey, this guy likes to pull guard. And I was like, thank God, because my mm-hmm. leg's destroyed. <laughs> so I'm like, change the game plans. I'll let him pull and I'll pass. Mm-hmm. So I had confidence in my jiu-jitsu, top or bottom. So did I, like, just because the game plan changed doesn't mean I'm not going to beat the guy. So, And, and what's <clears> interesting, <throat> too, is like game plan for a lot of people, I think they assume – that game plan is going to be like, okay, you're going to go for your single leg, and then if it's not there, you're going to switch and start going for double legs, and then if it's not there, you're going to go for a collar drag. It's like, no, it's not that. Think broader. Yeah, game plan is I'm going to try to play top. I'm going to wrestle this guy, or this guy's wrestling is really good. I need to connect to him and pull guard. Right. You know, yes. I'm going to sweep early, you know, just like simple things. And I look back to like, you know, all those matches of – that we've had, we've all coached each other a lot of different times at this point. And there's a lot of trust in the coach, whoever's coaching, even though it's like, you know, we'll be switching back and forth. It's just like, it's hard to be as an athlete to be in that perspective of like, this is what is best for me. Cause as an athlete, you got to believe that you're going to do anything, right? Yep. You're going to be- believe like, okay, I'm going to win at every position, no matter where we go. But as a coach, you go, okay, this is the best avenue to win. Yeah, and just having those simple, you know, I, you know, and we changed your game plan a lot that tournament because you got hurt. Yeah, you know, yeah. and it was like, you know, you see that it seems to make such a difference though to have a a simple enough game plan that can actually be followed. I think we did that too in St. Louis for you because we were talking about your guy and you want to have a specific game plan uh-huh. and you fought him twice in the second one. I'm like, man, let's go fucking smash him. Let's go out there and just <laughs> go smash. smash you yeah. It's like, because you, you, you were like, you, the first one you pulled and you were going to put uh-huh. 50, 50 and everything. And then the second one, I was like, Junior, just go out there and smash. And that's exactly what happened. You broke yeah, him. It was good. Sometimes the best game plan is just do jujitsu. You know? Yeah. yeah. It's just like you have, you know, it's not always, that's not always a game plan you can go in with. No. But when you just are like, Hey, I think, you have better jujitsu than this guy. Don't overthink it. You know, just go grapple. You would, you would not overthink it if you were in the gym. Well, some other things too. You got to think about like that. We people really don't talk about a whole lot. That I, I really focus on is strategy. Like there is a strategy to the game. Um, if you're a really good wrestler, judo guy, man, back up and play the corners. Mm-hmm. You know, play the edges. You mess up a throw, run out of bounds a little bit. You act like you're taking them down. Okay, start again, back up to the edges, and do it again. So that's the strategy in and of itself. If you go against, um, you know, a, a, a good strategy I use for the, the big boys is double collar grips, and I just try to, like, snap down, but I'm really just, like, keeping them away from my legs and trying to do anything until they pull, mm-hmm. right, or until I can get a clean pull. Um, so there, there are some strategies, circling, um, playing the edges. Um, but, man, the last tournament, uh, Nashville Open, I went against a, a lightweight, and he had an amazing guard, so I pulled on him first. We did double guard pull. I knew he was going to get the advantage because a lot of people, when you do, do double guard pull, a strategy is to come and get the advantage. Fell right into a sweep, and I got on top and smashed. So strategy is important. <clears throat> um, I think it's really not talked about a lot is strategy. And the other thing, too, is like you just said with jiu-jitsu, you just got to believe you're better than that person. <laughs> like if you worry about what they're going to do, you're not going to get off what you're going to do. And so, um, you know, some of the some of the competitors at our gym worry too much about, well, they're good at this, they're good at that. And my answer is like, I don't give a shit what they're good at. What are you good at? Yeah. Go out there and play your game. They're never gonna get off their game if you're if you do what you're gonna do. 
Just be first, right? Like be first. Like Bob said. Just like be <laughs> first. You're not first, you're last. <laughs> you're last. It's that's true. A, that's you don't get going first. Right there. Yeah. Well, on that note, this is something that, like, I have always noticed. I, I think I've noticed it more with training with you. Um, you know, I think we're all in agreement that jiu-jitsu is jiu-jitsu. But Brazilians understand strategy in a way that Americans don't seem to most of the time. Most Americans, they like to put something extra on the the match of, oh, well, I'm always hunting for the submission or something along those lines. And it's it's idiotic. We're fighting under a very specific rule set. The, the goal is to win that match, right? Because you can... I, I get a lot more opportunities to submit people if I get deeper into the tournament. But if I lose in the first round because I was so I, – I had put some other thought of what winning actually was. No, winning is getting your hand raised at the end. And that was something that uh, um, I just know that, like, Junior, you've helped me with so much as a competitor is just like, no, just do do this. this you'll win. You know, you'll win this way. This is, oh, this guy has a huge hole in his game. Just just go exploit that, you know? Even if it's not what you play as much, like, just go win. You got to do whatever you got to do to win, right? I think that's a... Yeah, I think uh, starting... It was a big change moving here. I think that the Brazilian mindset, the guys are a little different, the way they, you know... You guys take jiu really serious, and you guys are pretty, you know... But they... They take a lot, how to win, how I'm going to do to win. If you're doing MMA, it's different, it's MMA rules. If you're doing heel hooks, heel hooks, but we're doing gi in IBJJF tournament, you know. I wish you were great, like Roger Grace, and just go there and choke everybody. Of course. You know, but there's not a lot of Ro Roger, Roger Graces out there. And uh, I think you got to go by the rules and try to find a better way to win, you know. Somebody might be better than you, so you got to find a way to beat a guy that is better than you. So you got to figure it out. And that's a good point. Like you brought up Hodger, you know, so let's say 2009 when Hodger submitted everybody, there were there were 11 other world champions there because he won his weight class and open class. 11 other world champs came from that tournament. Not one of them submitted everybody, yeah. but they were the best in the world that day. Mm -hmm. So there's only one GOAT, and I and I feel like the, the it's a marketing thing again. You know, Gordon Ryan's out there submitting everybody. Oh, you suck if you don't submit everybody. Okay, I mean, yeah, like, but not everybody's Gordon Ryan. Yeah. Not everybody's Hodger Gracie. Yeah. Not everybody's Bouchesh or Hodolfo. And I and I used that the other night, like, Roger, Bouchesh, Hodolfo. And not even Bouchesh. I don't think he's even submitted everybody. He's one, he's squeaked by some wins. Mm -hmm. But Hodolfo and Hodger, I think, are the two guys that submitted everybody in, in one year of their tournament. Um, In, the, let's say, eight years or 10 years, they're both active. That's 130 world champions that did not submit every single person. Yeah. Two out of 130. That doesn't make the world champion any less better. It's just like if you compare it to <clears throat> American wrestling or Olympic wrestling, how often do you see a pin in the <laughs> national title finals? Like pretty much never. Never. Like that's, that's like the shot heard around the world if that actually happens. So the idea that you're going to submit everybody, it's a goal. It's a really awesome goal to have, but you don't suck if you don't submit every person at a tournament. And the other thing, too, is um, this is going to be controversial. You might like this topic, actually. All right. I think submitting off your back is worthless. It's for the week. I don't. Like, if you get over a certain weight class. Yeah, it goes by weight class. Submitting, over, submitting off your back is. Unless you're Roger Gracie. <laughs> yeah, he but he was, no, but he was guy. also he was choking guys from top. Yeah, but he did a lot of arm bars from the guard. He did stuff. back in the early in the day. Yeah, Broke <coughs> arm. that was, yeah, but Jacare still won. That's yeah. true. That's that sub versus winning. That's, that is that's true. that sub versus winning method. But yeah, I feel like if you're if you're a um, heavy, super heavy, ultra heavy, submitting off your back is a dangerous venture. Dude, even at medium heavy, yeah. uh, I, I that was something that you know I had a really good um, guard game for medium heavy, and I ended up changing it because I was like, it needs to be sweep dependent. Being on top when you have that much more gravity, to, you know, with you, yeah. it matters so much in the ten minute matches. Oh yeah, you know, um, it's just like just too long to be underneath somebody carrying their weight if they weigh that much. 
It's the same thing in a five minute match for Masters. That's like, true. I don't want to be under some of those big boys for five minutes. Yeah. So I don't want to be under any of the ultra heavyweights for no, 30 God, seconds. It's miserable. You know? It's miserable. But yeah. So for my, my game was the same way coming up. I'm sure with you early on jujitsu, old school Gracie way, closed guard, cross choke from the guard. That's mm -hmm. closed guard. That's what I was, did until probably like brown belt. And then I was like, man, this sucks. I herniated <laughs> disc in my neck. I had yeah, injuries. I'm like, man. Up. So now, and like you said, how your game changed. Like, my game changed completely. I try to get on top as fast as I can and just smash. It's way better, easier. That's old man jiu jitsu. It's old man jiu jitsu, yeah. Also, the way the size, right? Because if you also, if there is no, I don't know any lightweight that finish everybody awards or anything like I don't that. Either. Or middleweight. I know Marcelo got C1. Nobody's what, about, what about Mikey? What's the Mikey? If he's to submit everybody, gotta check it out. But I know now because when he beat me on, I don't know. I know he never tapped me on. Yeah. Oh yeah, you're right. Yeah. It's way harder in the lighter division to submit everybody, even to pass somebody's guard. Like I think know. passing a lightweight guard is probably the hardest thing to yeah, do. Yeah, those guys are so flexible. Mm -hmm. You know. Hey guys, Josh McKinney here. Just wanted to interrupt the episode really quick and tell you guys about what I mentioned at the beginning of the episode. We have a deal for you on Nick Sanders' most recent instructional, the Star Spangled Spider Guard. As you guys know, um, Nick Sanders is a veteran. He is a, a very, very high level jujitsu black belt, high level competitor. And he is known for being able to play guard at super heavyweight and ultra heavyweight and being able to sweep some really big and tough guys. And one of the main positions he does that from is his spider guard. Um, and it's really more of his knowledge of grip fighting in general, but he will take your spider guard to the next level with this course. Um, I still use stuff that I picked up while we filmed that instructional and we filmed that instructional like three years ago. And so so uh, man, this this content is just excellent, and it is 40% off only at simplifyingjujitsu.com. And so I'll make sure to link it in the description. But if you go to simplifyingjujitsu.com, you will be able to find the Star Spangled Spider Guard and the big discount on the Star Spangled Spider Guard. This discount ends March 1st, and so um, you only have two weeks to jump on this deal. But Get your guard better this year. It's 2024. Time to evolve. It's time to learn to play guard. And so uh, you can do that with the Star Spangled Spider Guard. Let's go ahead and get back into today's episode. Man, that's, that's interesting, though, that it's just... There is, I was just actually talking to, to Kyle, it's a little bit different of a, con, uh, a perspective on it, but it's just like, there is so much evolution in jujitsu all the time. And if you start to paint yourself into a box of this is the only way, or this is like the noble way to win, um, you're just, you're going to get passed up. You're going to get left behind. You're going to start losing. And um, it's the guys that can evolve as the game evolves uh, that seem to be the best. Well, yeah, because just like with everything, you, you learn a move and it starts working on everybody. It's great. People aren't going to just let you keep doing it. They're going to create <laughs> counters. The same thing in the jiu-jitsu world. I think it's even, even like easier to learn counters nowadays with Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, flow grappling all these tournaments are you can see them live and like literally you can go back that next day and drill something that the world champs are doing and teach it to your gym and then create counters to it mm -hmm. and that's the, yeah like the game just keeps on evolving so if you're stuck in that close guard cross grip arm bar from close guard man that's not gonna work i think like there is a theory that society already got where we are now when they went down like we build something, you go so far ahead that you go back again. <laughs> uh -huh. I think she shits a lot like that. Um, I, like, I stopped doing butterfly a while ago, like a purple belt. Uh -huh. And I'm watching that guy from Europe, that guy with the long hair. Oh, Warzinski. Adam Warzinski. Sweeping everybody. Yeah. In a couple of those sweeps, my coaching floor, this should make us do over and over again. I was like, ah, this doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. Watch Rodolfo Vieira going through those butterfly guards like crazy. This guy is winning the wars, doing butterfly again, you know, and Soon we have somebody doing deep half a guard. They switch a little bit, but, you know, it's a lot of stuff I'm starting to drill again. 
they are I stopped re using a long time ago, you know, and I'm back at it again. I think we go like a while ago it was all about lapel guard, mm -hmm. like yeah. a warm guard. Yeah. And you see low and saw the guys countering and then people like, oh Yeah, you don't even see those really much it's hard anymore. To do it, yeah. Hardly at all. Like I don't think at the world's there was hardly any lapel yeah. guard being and, played. And it's like, you know, for me, here's my hot take on move that's making a comeback. I've been telling my students this double underpass. And the reason I, I say that. double underpass is not because it's ability to pass the guard, but when you are when you're competing five or six minutes, you're competing up to 10, some matches uh -huh. are 20 minutes now, controlling the pace of the match becomes one of the most important things. You know, back to that like, oh, submission is all that matters thing. It's like the same thing as um, in professional football, maybe 10 years ago, they used to, their bad thing they would say about Tom Brady before he won like four more Super Bowls was that he is a game manager. Like, oh, he's only a game manager. And like, that means that is this, that is this bad thing. That's this negative thing on him. But the thing about managing a game well and manage, managing a jujitsu match well is now it is me and the clock versus you. It's not just it's not just me versus you anymore. Right. You know, and it's like, oh, I'm up an advantage and you cannot you cannot deal with my double underpass. Well, you're gonna open up a pass for me because you are down. You know, you are now losing to the clock. I think double under has made a quick return last ADCC or two ADCCs ago. I forget which one it was, but I was watching that they they were doing double under passes. I think it was two two ADCCs ago, twenty nineteen. Man, they were doing double unders on everybody uh, to prevent leg locks. Mm -hmm. You know, they're again, you can't enter into legs if you don't have the butterfly hooks. Mm -hmm. And so um, that was a pretty big um, yeah. meta game going on there. It's tough. At the, I was just talking about like everybody's worried about leg lock and they see somebody come with a double and they're going back on time like to counter, right? It's such a And passing on the knees is getting big again, which I hate. <laughs> I hate it. But passing yeah. on the knees, people are passing Can't on the knees. Can't move Kai Watts on his knees. <sighs> That's true. That's true. He's a great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is the you know you look at you look at the way Kyle plays jujitsu. It is like I don't care if I can't do anything, you definitely won't get to do anything. Now his jujitsu is a modern jujitsu. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> none of us are having fun. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but like, do you think the gi will help you? No gi, or is yeah, no? I think that. Um, okay. I, I was just talking to Jeff about it the other day, um, yesterday actually. I, I think that the future is like the Mika Gavaos, the guys who are good at gi and, and no gi, who win ADCC and the world. Like yeah, like and, and the Rotolos too. Rotolos, you know? yeah. Um, those guys are the ones who are going to be. I think all the gi guys won ADCC, most of them, right? So it was. Um, so who would have been the. Kynan. Yeah, the lightweight was the that guy, shark. Marigali. No, yeah, he didn't no, win he didn't. Win. Maragalli didn't win. Uh, but baby, baby, shark. baby Shark won. Baby Shark was in the final against the other teammate. Both guys key. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, um, 77 was uh, Mika, Mika versus Cade. Both and, key guys. Uh -huh. Key and Ogi, yep. 88 was Giancarlo Bordoni. Against Hook in the Hulk, final. Uh -huh. yeah. Both key guys. Don, yeah. Giancarlo stopped training in the gi. You know, six you months him before. On gi, right? I did. That was yeah. actually his last tournament in the gi. Um, I think he, he must have got scared. I don't know. No, he was scared. I yeah, was he was like, "Man, I really hurt my fingers choking this guy." You know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I want to. I don't want to know if I want to continue. You know. Uh, yeah, he trained in the gi. He was a gi guy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Look, Gordon Ryan trains in the gi every now and then too. He was helping Marigali for that. Yeah, that fight. Well, I don't think I have no, no gi guy like he's straight up no gi guy that never went to a gi gym or was not under any like. Let's say I don't know jiu -jitsu, of any. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu lineage or anything like that. I don't know of any. Me either. You don't I mean you're gonna yeah, I think Jiu Jitsu is Brazilian. I think you're right, and you have to train in the gi to be good. You know? At least a little bit. I right? think those are the hot takes from the episode so yeah. far. Oh, yeah. You know? Is uh yeah, I think for me personally, being able to switch back and forth keeps me interested in jujitsu. You know, it's like if you compete in the gi all year and you've competed for like nine months and then you're like, man, I don't feel like doing more, more international opens. I don't want to do this. Like in no gi worlds, no gi pans is coming up. 
a lot of times you'll be like, I'll do those. Yeah. You know, I'll screw it. it. I'll, I'll do those. Those are fun. You get to wrestle a little more. You get to just train something different. Yeah. I feel like, though, the American jiu-jitsu part, the wrestling definitely keeps things interesting. Like, I, I think adding wrestling into, which I'm sure I know the Brazilians that actually read um, Dreisel's book, mm-hmm. Closed Garden. Um, what's it? Who's the founder of Gracie Baja? Uh, Carlos mm-hmm. Jr. He talks about adding wrestling into jiu-jitsu back in the day. But I think, like, that keeps me motivated, too, is like, okay, well, this is a whole new art that I'm not very good at that I can just kind of practice and have fun with. Have you read Drysdale's new book? No. Um, so one of my students has it. If you want to read it, I'll, I'll, uh, he sent me a copy of it and I had him on the podcast, but it was mostly about how, um, modern day jujitsu, modern day jujitsu training, how like none of it came from Elio. It, it came from Mm. Carlson? Carlson. Yeah, it came from Carlson. Carlson that's, yeah. I'm Carlson Grace Lineage, and I learned that from, the, you know, they that was, tell me. That's what he know. said, is he, that, that he Carlson said, guys. You got to wrestle, you got to be strong. I heard that. And then when you're training somebody from the other lineage, they still have that, like, oh, you don't need to be strong, you can survive. Nobody can mount on you, don't let people pass your guard, don't let them get position on you. Be strong, be fast. That was the mindset since I was a white belt. That's how I learned Jiu Jitsu, you know? And uh, got to wrestle. They'll make me wrestle a lot. I hate wrestling. And uh, I think it's, it's pretty different. And yeah. uh, I, he's, ho- he's right, you know. I think. He spread it to the masses. Like BTT. Yeah. Um, you know, the, Carls, uh, Carlson, um, he, like, against Elio's will, like, started teaching poor people. Mm-hmm. And and then he did group settings. Is, and that, so, was, that was the big thing yeah. as he was saying is, like, you know, he's like, how do you train jiu-jitsu now? He's like, it's not private lessons. Yeah. It's like, that was... You know, the, the Gracie Academy was built on private lessons and it was like, it was structured very differently. Mm-hmm. And he just, and he has a lot of fact behind it. Um, and uh, yeah, the book is honestly, it's a really great read. He he tracks jujitsu all the way back from like kind of the same origins of pro wrestling, which is like the carnivals where yeah. guys would would wrestle wrestle people on the in the in the crowd and be like hey i'll break your arm for 10 bucks (laughs) and so (laughs) yeah man that is a that that book was really good the uh the the podcast i did with him i really feel like he covers a lot of that information on that episode but it is just it's just about like hey this is how jujitsu is trained and it was built around what actually works see it's crazy so i my lineage is crazy i started off with um salo ribeiro so Salo Ribeiro's Gracie Umaita. And we we had a little bit of that, um, like, don't use strength kind of thing. And then we switched to Helsin, and then it was all, there's only closed guard, there's no such thing as half guard, oh, or all these yeah. guard, cross chokes, arm bars, don't use strength. And then uh, then I moved to St. Louis, started training with Boggy, also Gracie Umaita. We, we started getting a little more into... Yeah, be physical, be strong. A lot of guys did MMA there. Yeah, a lot of MMA, know. a lot of American wrestlers came in. And then switched to Novo Nyao, which is non-Gracie lineage. Um, and so Leo Pisania is non-Gracie, and it was like train hard, train, like fight. This is a fight. Use muscle strength, train hard. And then Junior and I have our own team now, and we have a lot of influence with wrestlers from his background, American top team, and my background, and yeah, we train like we train hard, we train smart, but like yeah, you need to be aggressive, you need to be strong, you have to be in shape mm-hmm. and be able to last, you know, however long your fight is. If you're not, you're not going to win tournaments. And so that's that's kind of the the growth of of myself and Junior, I believe. Yeah, I think when I'm trying to get in shape, I go to revive. You know, yeah, I right. think the 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 intensity is there, and then I also like if I injure somebody, I don't feel bad. Yeah, you know, like ah, oh, this is one of Nick. This is this doesn't cost me anything. <laughs> we money. lost a couple members because of you, but yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's me as much as it's just like I'll come in and I'll be like, Junior, I've been tapping people with pressure, and Junior will be like, No way, white belt, come here, roll with Josh, roll with Josh full speed right Dude, now. Mother's milk. And yeah, and jo- and Junior will be like, Tap him with pressure, Josh, <laughs> kill him. The white belt didn't tap. I have this guy. Yeah, Josh was tapping. Yeah, that was that was Lawrence, bro. I put him with oh, Lawrence. God, Lawrence it. ate it, and he didn't train the rest of the week. Had fever after. But he didn't tap. <laughs> like he was sick. Dude, like, Lawrence, you, he needed a blue belt after that. That guy, one. Lawrence, is the American zombie. 
Dude, he doesn't <laughs> stop. He's he doesn't. the American zombie. You know, St. Louis Open, he comes home with a gold medal, but his... His, I think one might have been a semifinal round. Huff was coaching him, and I come over and I start helping. And um, I'm like, oh, this poor dude. He is, you know, he's at heavyweight, as tall as he is. I'm like, he's he's in trouble. He's fighting a guy that's obviously wrestled for a very long time. He gets thrown about 75 times. But every time, he bellies down, and he gets his hips up before he gets scored on. Every single time. He's down a lot of advantages. And I'm like, hey, this guy's getting exhausted from throwing him. And Lawrence is still peppy. And there was this point that Lawrence has like, is in front headlock standing. He's got a belt grip and a pant grip. And I was like, yeah, yeah, do that. Try to run him down. Later on, Lawrence told me like, no, I didn't have any intention of doing that. I was just trying to hold on. And he literally ran this dude down, took him down, beat him two to nothing. And uh, then did the same thing in the finals. Well, that guy was a college wrestler yep. at White Belt that yep. was sandbagging. But, I mean, yeah, I guess you don't use any energy just getting thrown. You know I, what I mean? It's I like, do. <laughs> I, I, if you get if thrown, I got you just thrown, thrown 75 <laughs> times, I'm, I'm gassed. I pull guard and I get tired. <laughs> yeah. But one complaint I have against the head knot guys, they did us wrong, was Lawrence – Won his first match at a Fuji tournament or AGF. I don't know. Oh who it was. no, not this! Yeah, he fought oh, one no. of his guys, and they couldn't get in quick enough to coach Lawrence. Was coaching somebody else, and this guy shot on Lawrence. Lawrence got a guillotine. The guys in side control, and little Jeff is like, "You have it, Lawrence. You have it." The guys in side control have him on the side control. Von Flucho. Von, Von Flucho. <laughs> and don't let it go, Lawrence. Don't let it go, Lawrence. Tell, telling Lawrence not, not to let it go. So Lawrence goes out. He's out. So I look at the side. Lawrence on the floor. His arms trail on, like he's in the cross, you know, <laughs> on the out, cold. And they're like, what happened? And Jeff tells him they started laughing. Like, I was like, man. man Listen, this is, dive, I, I tell, I was the one. Jeff didn't even know that it was one of our guys that he was coaching against. He's like, yeah, Junior told me to coach to coach Lawrence. I'm in. I'll do it. I'll do anything it was for one Junior. Of your guys? And so it was one of our Jerseyville guys, right? So Ju Jeff has never met him, but you should recognize that, like, hey, every our coaches are on the other side I across had a head from nod you. Patch on his He's gi. got a head nod patch on the gi. But Jeff is like, and Jeff, sure, like that he was coaching him correctly. He's like, oh, Jeff, oh, you're going to finish this choke. You've got him. You've got him. And then as soon as he goes to sleep, Jeff goes from like one coaching chair, like looks over and sees our whole team celebrating and then goes to the other side. Man, they, they did it on purpose. Yeah. They did it on hey, purpose. man, we got that win, though. We got you guys that. did a like, dirty win. But that's a dirty win. Don't you ask Jeff to coach for you. He's an idiot. I probably didn't ask him. Get out of here! You always you He's ask always Jeff, there when dude, you go to a tournament. Jeff is always by your side. I'll you know, I'll you know, come back come to the gym on a Friday sometime, and Jeff will get out of his car and open up his trunk and start pulling out bags of trash. I'm like Jeff, what is this? I'm like, oh, Junior told me I had to get I had to throw away this trash, and he's throwing away in the head nod dumpster. He Look, drove it forty five minutes hey, to Granite City. He he might be our student now. Yeah, he is. I gave him a stripe. You did. Yeah. You gave him two was stripes. Was one or two? Two. Did he just say he put two more on his belt the other day? He put one more on one his more. belt. Take no, it off, Nick. <laughs> yeah. Keep this Bryce was telling me that. I'm like, yeah, you know they're imaginary anyway, right? You know? Like, <laughs> no, he's not. Dude. Yeah. No. Bryce is just jealous. You yeah. Know? Bryce over there wishing he had three or four stripes. Yeah, Bryce, yeah, a, purple belt. yeah, Bryce a purple belt, bro. Well, I know. I'm just Zero saying. Zero stripes. Yeah. That's true. You don't have Zero any stripes. stripes on your purple belt, dude. <laughs> Jeff, every Friday, he goes to the gym, he trains there, and then he sleeps in one of those rooms and stay for the night class. Yeah, and, and then trains again. He teaches kids. Man. Yeah, he's stud. I would never let him teach any of my guys. He's nuts. I will say this, he'll, though. He'll, he'll teach a class, and he'll be like, he'll be like yeah, you don't have to tap to that. <laughs> you know, you could just, yeah, they, just, like, they, they can't finish that. You could just eat it. I'll say this. He is, he is the future of... Uh, St. Louis tag team jiu-jitsu, <sighs> unfortunately, he is. Unfortunately. Until we get another Matt Green out at Revive. We yeah. got, look. You need the Matt Green to Derek, be 18, though. Derek and Drew, if those two. Oh, yeah, I have two kids. They man. That seems, they're talented. Man, they're super, they're Baron Bolowin at, you know, nine years old. I mean, they're good. I'll tell you this. Jeff would smash those nine-year-olds, yeah, yeah. bro. For now, but they'll be. 
I don't want to push them to compete. I had that problem in Florida. Mm -hmm. We're really into comp competition. I had a huge competition team, kids competition team. And they go to these tournaments, the parents are almost fighting the kids, almost fighting me, <laughs> complaining. It's pretty crazy. Last tournament, uh, I took one of my 11-year-old girls, girl, shy little girl, was scared to compete. They matched her with a 15-year-old yeah, teenager. Yeah. It was pretty bad. I tried to complain, and the father like, no, no. You gotta let her have the experience. It's like, oh, I think that girl is too big. Not a good experience for her. But if they keep training, you hear about those. Yeah, and she and she still training. trains. She still yeah. trains, and she she just like eh, whatever, you know. Like it wasn't traumatic to her because we didn't make it a big deal. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like okay. That's the hardest thing with kids. Though. We were just talking about it before. Uh, you know, Junior was forty five minutes late. <laughs> um, but we were just talking about it. The hardest thing with kids is so many kids would be really, really good at jujitsu if they stuck with it, but they just don't, you know? Yeah. And it's just like, it is so hard to keep them to transition from the kid's class to the adult class, you know? And to, you know, to keep them just doing it consistently. And so, you know, that's why you get, you get kids like Jeff that are just farmers that have nothing else to do. I don't oh, even know yeah. if he graduated high school. I don't even know if he has a family. I he's don't. always by himself. Listen, I've never met his parents. He claims that he started training at 13 years old. Uh -huh. I don't think he has parents. I have I no. Think so. I don't know I, where they. Dude, I've never met his family. I, I don't. I don't know where he lives. For all I know, he could probably sleep in your yeah, gym. People, he, for all I know, he lives at Hedna. We're not lying, and people might think we're lying. In Chicago, he was there by himself. I was like, "Where's your parents?" Like, oh, they dropped me off here. They will come to pick me up later. I was like, I want to meet your mom. She's like, no, no, don't worry about it. <laughs> After the, <laughs> we finished the, the, the matches, he's like, where are you going now? I was like, I'm going to my hotel. I was like, can I come with you? Okay, come, Jeff. So we go to the hotel, me and my friend that was there competing. Jeff's there, sitting in the corner of our room, we watching UFC fight. He stand up. He's like, oh, I'm going home. Just Next day, uh, at 2 a.m., I go online. He's online. I was like, hey, bro, go to sleep. You're competing tomorrow. He's like, never. That's why he stays back. <laughs> I get there early, 8 a.m. Jeff is there running around the tournament. It's like, Jeff, did you sleep? Where is your no, mom? No. So I should drop me off here early. I was like, yeah. He's a cyborg. Oh, man. He was, we, we had him in Orlando and um, it, for pans. And he was, I, I'm, I'm trying to sleep the first night, and it's 2 or 3 in the morning. And he's jumping down the stairs, seeing how many stairs he can make it down, right? He's 18 years old at this point. And so the next day, I'm like, I've got to, I've got, you know, we had this like two days where we weren't, no one was competing. We're not even going to be at the tournament. Like, I got to figure out something. And so what I ended up doing was in the morning, I gave him his first cup of coffee. And uh. he was bouncing off the walls, but he was, I knew he was wasting a lot of energy. In Florida, made sure he got a ton of sun. Sun exposure plays a huge role in, in breaking a child. And so he, uh, he starts to kind of to fade a little bit. By 9 p.m., we're all sitting in the hot tub at our, uh, like where we're staying. And he is like falling asleep in the hot tub. And I'm like, I'm a dad. I did it. Yeah, you know? that's training, right? right? For the real got you trained for the real deal. <laughs> yeah. That's why you should have a kid. <laughs> you are he's right here. You should have another one, Josh. <laughs> I don't know, man. That's kids are a lot, dude. I feel I almost feel bad for Taryn Jr.'s groin when he just had a, a newborn. I mean, I don't, you know, because I know he's gonna try to kill me. It's true. It's true. I wish you came the first month when your baby was just born. That would be a, come to revive. Be a terrible idea, man. You, I man. Told everybody. You would have done good. I know. I, I'm, hey, I got to work harder, not smart. I work smarter, not harder. I I think I trained like the day my daughter was born. I want to train some jiu-jitsu. <laughs> Nick jiu trains every day. <laughs> I'm, I'm, it's, I'm regretting it now. I'm getting beat up. But, yeah, I, I train a lot. Man, yeah, I don't think I've trained since my son's been born, you know? I mean, like, I'll train with Bryce, but... That's not really training. Not training. Like I said, yeah. you know, like, when I rolled white belt, she, it's, it's, not, it's not a quality round. You know? Warm-up round. You know, honestly... Bryce, belt's interchangeable. I don't know if you guys brought your G's, but are, isn't Bryce supposed to grapple us yeah. all one after another? So, you didn't. I didn't tell you about this. Bryce, two weekends ago here at Head Nod, I was like, how are you going to feel when Junior, myself, and, and Josh just start going in on you halfway through the podcast? He's like, don't worry. Which we're doing right now. He's like, don't worry. <laughs> 
I'm gonna it's gonna go like this. I'm gonna fight is it Josh first, yeah. Junior second, then you last, Nick. I was like, that is a terrible lineup. Oh wow, this guy is tough. <laughs> that's gonna, a, that's figure out what, what, I didn't show up for open mass Sunday though. Yeah, I wasn't there. Yeah, yeah, that's true. He did. He, but also, he, who was still in Brazil last Sunday? Yeah, Sunday? that's true. And that's, our family loves us, so yeah. we'll probably <laughs> join them. That's true. If honestly, if Bryce survived that, I would give him a stripe. You know, I haven't yeah. given a stripe in seven years, but I would, I would give him a stripe. What do you think about that lineup, though? If you had to do it, I think that that is, man, I just don't. I think that that's the worst. I would probably want. I don't think there's any way to take that to take that lineup well. I was thinking about because Jeff and I were talking about it last night. I was thinking about it. I was like, man, who would I want to go first? I was like, no, Josh would just gas me out. Like, I would just go with you. I'd be gassed. And I have no, in like with Bryce, I would have no intention of submitting him. I've submitted him enough times. Yeah. I would be like, hey, guys, I'm going to wear this dude down for the team. See, that's you why know? you can't, you can't <laughs> have Josh go first. That's the thing. And I was like, yeah, Josh would gas me out. Junior would just smash the shit out of me. And, and I'm like, I'll just smash the shit out of me too. So I was like, man, well, there is no good. There is that is not a good. That's not a good lineup. Bryce is in for a world of hurt when we stop recording hey, Friday, this podcast. Friday, Bryce, come up to revive. Starting in January. Yeah, January. Ooh. Okay. Man. All right. January's like next week, bro. Like that's. that's I'll be there. That's gonna be a lot. It's gonna be fun. All right. Well, luckily I'll have Bryce there to take some of the beatings for me. So <laughs> on <laughs> on that note, on the note of Jeff has no family and we're going to kill Bryce, um, for you guys with running a school together, uh, like you guys both, you guys both definitely skill-wise could run your own jiu-jitsu schools. You know, you're both very good coaches. How do you guys go about not stepping on each other's toes? And also not only that, but... Um, I feel like you guys do a good job of even relying on each other's strengths and uh, and being able to run your team that way. Man, for me, I, like it's just not having an ego. Also, like I got I I'm okay with taking a backseat. Like I'm okay with it. Like I, I Junior has great leadership. He's he steers us in the right direction, and I'm okay with just being there, being a part of it, helping out, um, guiding when I can. But I'm okay, like, whatever, if Junior's like, hey, Nick, this is how it kind of works. Like, hey, I want to do this. I'm like, cool, man, let's do it. Mm -hmm. And vice versa, if, if I say, hey, Junior, what do you think about this? He's like, yeah, cool. Like, Nick is a good partner. It's like, he doesn't like cleaning the mats. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, that's the only thing, if you ask me. Otherwise, everything else is, like, super cool. We talk about changing a schedule or teaching a technique. He's like, man, that's awesome. He's excited about everything. Yeah, he'll make it happen. And I uh, have no complaints about him. Uh, I think it was the best move I did because when I went to open Revive, he told me he wanted to have his own gym and start doing something. He was teaching here in Hit Squad. Hit Squad. I was like, yeah, let's do something here in St. Charles. And uh, a couple of months after that, my heart stopped and I went crazy. Yeah, like, that was bad. Crazy. I couldn't be in the gym. I didn't sleep for three months. I wasn't there anymore. And if it wasn't for Nick, the revival be gone. We have to close down or let somebody else teach. And uh, he not only kept the place alive, taught all the classes, kept me motivated, had patience with me, and he also kept me pushing me to compete. I had him there by my side. I was like, because the doctor told me, never compete again. Yeah. If you have a lot of people screaming or put under a lot of pressure, you're going to faint. You have syncope and your heart might stop again. And I think him, you, Kai Watson, the guys that pushed me, to get back and competing, I did pens. Yeah, only did pens to make sure I wasn't gonna faint. I was like, when I w I start getting dizzy when I walk in, I was like, oh, I'm gonna faint. I'm gonna faint. It'd be really embarrassing. I sp spin under the guy and I could come up in a sweep. I remember Nick, come up, come up. I saw him I was like, I'm not coming up. I'm staying here. I'm dizzy. <laughs> and after the match, I guess I'm not that bad. I didn't faint. I'm not, I'm gonna yeah, do it again. Good. Let's do Nashville and. That review, I was like, I'm killing this guy. Yeah. I feel great. And then, you, and, you, and then St. Louis, you won. Yeah. So I think he. what makes it easy for me is we don't bump heads. If it if it's really hard about something, like, dude, this needs to be done this way, we do it that way. Some stuff, like, I want to do done in, different, in a certain way. He understands. We pro, we're both really relaxed with Jessica. 
We let her pick the clothes, yeah. design. It's, we don't, you know, right? We don't. Jessica, go I'm not gonna lie. Jessica runs the show. She's if it weren't. <laughs> so I look at it this way: like, if it weren't for Jessica, we would be in some trouble because I yeah. don't know. I don't know shit about running a business mm -hmm. besides like teaching classes and and being a recruiter. Jessica's the back one to revive. I'll say that all day long. We like, give everything for free, too. <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> me and Nick, like, I'm we work and Jessica talks to me all the time, like, dude, you gotta stop. We got all these clothes. I, you know, you a lot of times see somebody, somebody, oh no, man, just take it. Oh, yeah, you know, we, so, yeah, we're bad about or that. Oh, membership. Somebody talk to me or Nick, ask for a deal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, yeah, we think like, okay, let's just get him in the door. Jessica's like, no. This how is our how much you want to <laughs> Jessica was talking to me a couple of days ago? Look, look, in the beginning, you gave all these people a deal, they still like. That's why you have a lot of men. I was like, Jessica, don't worry about it. Okay, we do it better now. But yeah. and uh, for another guy working with your wife, it's easy to like, hey man, don't talk to my wife like that. Or don't do. That. You can get like in those situations. Some people, but Nick's super respectful, yeah. and we don't get involved in those small things that girls are pretty strong about. Or her as a manager, like make sure you charge people, or we're gonna do this design or this outfit or we should get the match the match should be white or the match should be pink oh you yeah, whatever we like <laughs> cool. like can we roll on it yeah, yeah. we roll uh -huh. on it you know so and um so i'm a some stuff in the gym i like done certain way like you know a lot of those things are will help me and nick too a lot of we pretty relax you do whatever you want but we want to have some rules and and me and nick have the same mindset so i think we're good yeah and i, th I think like a lot of a lot of the, a lot of problems that the jujitsu schools have is, um, you know, they open up and they think they know everything about business, or they think, oh, I'm a black belt, I'm gonna do awesome at jujitsu, or the money's just gonna roll in once I open up, kind of thing. Uh, it'll be falling out of my pockets. I've heard that before. But uh, you know, the thing is, is like when you have a partner, um, it kind of keeps you in re in reality. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. like you're not the cult leader, mm -hmm. you're you're not the head honcho. Um, and, and then also like, man, running a gym by yourself is stressful. Yeah. Like, like junior said, if, if he was, if I wasn't there, it would have shut down. There's times for the army when I'm gone for, yeah, for a, a month, month or yeah. two, or it's like, who am I going to get to run the gym? So, and then junior goes to Brazil. Sometimes Ooh, I just wake up and go to Brazil. Yeah. I do that all the time. Like, I know I'm last like, week we were supposed to podcast and you were in Brazil. <laughs> I didn't even know I was in Brazil. It's like, oh, I'm in Brazil. I can't drive there. I, got the guy. I can't just drive there, you know? And it's like, I can't go. So I, I do like if you find the right business partner and you and we laid it out early on, we have like an operations agreement, you know, like it's a contract that we sign, like here's our roles, here's what we do. And if you if you have the right business partner, having a partner is super, super, super valuable mm -hmm. for a gym for a, 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 a gym that's our gym's gonna have three hundred students. Mm -hmm. right, we'll probably have six hundred yeah. in the next three or four years. We might even have a, an, a, another gym at some other point. So having a business partner that you can trust and, and you're on the same page with is, is a lot of people see it as like, well, I don't want to share the money. Well, bro, you're only going to make X amount of dollars. At some point, you're going to have to branch off and either hire employees or, or get a partner. Yeah, I think it's not only about the money. I think some people have that power mentality. Yeah. I want to run the show. That's why I never wanted to use like my last name or like Nick last name or have our own logo. Like people do, oh, I want to have my black belt patch. Pedro Sanchez Jiu-Jitsu, right? It's like everybody done that before. I that's why I like having a name like Revive. We picked because we we're going to a stage in our life that we're yep. feeling burnout. We want to you know start. We want a place where people go train and they feel revived after, they feel good, you know. So that's why we picked the name. And I I like the ideas. Like this is a place and. It's not junior jiu-jitsu, it's not Nick jiu-jitsu, it's not, you know, soon we're going to have 30 black belts around them fighting, like, oh, it's, it's revive, it's all of us make revive, you know. And that that is a problem, too, is when you have a bunch of black belts in the gym that are individuals. I actually just was talking to someone from San Diego, and they're talking about Atos, like, when people train there, it's kind of like uh, every man for themselves, it's not a team. And so we, because everybody's a Ronin that goes there. They start off with another team and don't really have a whole lot of loyalty. And then they go there and they just want to get better as competitors, which is cool. But our gym is like, we I, we have a really good culture. If some of our black belts want to go start a gym, we support them. We just ask, hey, like, don't do it within the X mile radius. just a common courtesy thing. But it's like, man, like, if you want to go start a gym, cool. What do you need from us? 
Go Grand City. Grand City is a good spot. Grand City is a good spot. It's the future, you know. <laughs> that is. That's the place to be, man. Man, but honestly, um, I always love to to bash all of our friends' gyms, but honestly, Revive is such a great place. You guys have done such a great job um, building that that group, and it's so cool for me to have seen it from its its inception, you know, seen yeah, it, it from the beginning. Lot. Yeah, and six uh, students, like not even, I think we had like, like three people start with us. Yeah, Josh haven't put the mats in the other place. I yeah. did. Working, yeah. And he sat with me and explained kick side, explained everything. And he make I watch open their business. Like that's how we do things. Yeah. And man, I just, I remember even going over before Fridays were what they are now and going to the, uh, 9 or 10 a.m. class at, at Revive on Fridays before COVID hit. There were two people yeah. in there. You know, I was fighting Big Dan in, the, <laughs> in, remember, those, yeah. <laughs> in those classes. And, uh, yeah, just to see where you guys are at now, it's just really awesome to to get to see your guys' success on that. Thank you, man. I appreciate you, man. that. Thank you. So do you guys have, just while we're on that topic, um, and you guys did honestly give so many, like, subtle tips uh, in how people expect a gym to be. Uh, do you guys have any any kind of things that people should look at before deciding to maybe start a gym? Start a gym? Yeah. Because, you know, like so many guys, they, you know, I was, I was just talking about this to Watson and my dad. It's like so many guys, they, they dedicate their whole life to jiu-jitsu, you know, just like we did in – Initially, maybe starting a gym isn't even a thought process, but after 10 years, you know, after 15 years, you're like, wow, I really, I have dedicated everything to this, to this skill. I would like to, I would like to, uh, to teach. I would like to maybe make this a, um, a, a livelihood for myself. Uh, do you guys have any thoughts on that? I think, uh, the, the most important thing is living reality. Like you have to, you have to have the talk with yourself. Like, man, this could fail. Mm -hmm. This is a very real thing. Um, you know, so if there is a possibility of failure, how are you going to safeguard yourself against that? Right. So, um, when you take on that business venture, uh, it's all your time, all of your time, all of your money, everything goes into that gym. So, and then, you know, um, branding yourself within your community is another thing that you have to think about because there are some gyms where like they're not good people running the, the school and that gets on the community and you lose people. So you have to be, you have to be a good person like on and off the mat, so to speak. So it starts there. You have to know that this is a risk, right? And if you don't put in maximum effort and you think that people are just going to show up just because you put jujitsu on the side of a building and put some mats down um, and they're going to come train with you, that's not, that's not reality. So that's number one. Number two is to keep your students, um, you know, you have to be, you have to be humble, right? You have to, it's a two-way street. You have to listen to their needs and what they want to get from you because they're paying you. Like you're, you are their, um, they're your customer. So essentially they're paying your wages. They don't owe you shit. <laughs> they don't, they can leave at any moment in time. So you have to listen to what they want to get out of your gym and then you also have to kind of guide them on what we expect at our gym and where those lines cross. That's where you're going to have students who return, who spread um, the good word of your gym being awesome. Um, so I think those are some of the big things. That it's, it's the culture that you have to build. Um, it's not I'm the boss. This is how it goes. It's like, what do you guys want to learn? What do you guys want to what, what do you expect from jujitsu? Oh, you want to be. Just a soccer mom who gets in shape, cool. Come to this beginner's class. Oh, you want to be a world-class competitor? Okay, well, you need to be training with these guys. Go to these other affiliate gyms, and, you know, that's that's the culture is important. Yeah, I think what, I've, what Nick says is true, and it would be hard to start. I think it's really hard to start a gym. I think you make sure you're ready, you prepare, make sure you have your, at least your black belt being, you know, being black belt for a while or has a know what you're getting yourself into it's a job you know a lot of times we get to the gym we're tired nick's been working all day he gets that super stressed out like gotta start again teach kids 
teach adults, prepare classes, prepare a schedule. And it's, you know, if you want to grow, it'll be hard work. And uh, uh, I've been teaching since 2009, I think. And uh, a period of my life of two years, I didn't teach. And I was training more. I was feeling great because I was getting out of the, you know. I, even, I remember even telling my wife, like, for years, my clothes smell like the gym, my body, like, everything it was that gym. The gym I was... Every gym has a different smell, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I had that smell of the America Top Team Davy that was being there all day. I ran summer camps there. I stayed there all day for years. And that break, I was like, man, maybe I'll never teach you shit. It's like, I'll just train. It's amazing. I'll go to Kaiwats. I come to a gym all the time, and I'll just roll. And you guys give me advice. I was like, I don't want to teach anybody. Sometimes people ask me, I'll help, but I was just learning jiu or yeah. having fun. And then I kind of miss those days. They were great. I wouldn't go back in time. I love what I have now. Revive is my life. So before you start a gym, you got to see where you are in your life. If you want to, I think if we weren't partners, you wouldn't be able to live all the time and compete right. and do and focus on tournament. A lot of times, Nick's focus on rolling hard and you know, I'll teach the class, I'll work with the white belt, he does his thing and so you gotta see what point in your life you are on. It'll be hard to be competing every week and running a, a gym, you know. Yeah. I think um I think so I think having a business partner really helps out a lot, keeping you keeping you in in reality. I think that I think that's my overall arching theme for that is like you have to be realistic. You know, budget. How many <laughs> gym owners actually budget? Probably not many. Yeah, you know, they fly by the seat of their pants. Be like, if you want to have a gym, budget for it. Save up money to buy the mats. Like we were lucky. We we were making enough money. We paid off our mats in less than a year. Like we like because we budgeted appropriately. Mm -hmm. People don't talk about that stuff, and that's thousands, tens of thousands of dollars in mats we, paid off in a year. We had a job on the business going that we didn't have to be taking money out of the gym. Yeah. So I think that helped us a lot, you know, in the beginning. Yeah. We didn't need a paycheck, you know. Yeah. Every yeah. five paid. He, so. had, he had a business I was working. So we were working regular jobs and running a gym, which it sucks. But, you know, that's the dream that we had and it, it worked out. But, I mean, like, in my current line of work, my, my day job, um, I talked to my sales team. I'm like, look, this is your business. What you put into it is what you get out. Mm -hmm. So if you think you're going to go in and just open the doors at four, teach class at five, six, leave at eight every day, man, you're going to be broke. Uh huh. You know. So. Um, and there's so much more that goes into running a gym oh. than showing up at five and six. Yeah, like great, you can teach a class, but man, what are you doing to bring people in? What are you doing to innovate? What are you, what are you doing to make to set your gym apart from Gracie Baja? Mm -hmm. or Gracie Umaita or Jack's MMA or whatever it is, you know, like what are you doing better than everybody else where they want to come train with you? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, get into, get into your own gym is a daunting task, but I mean, it's worth it if you want to do it. But man, there's a lot that people don't really realize. I, yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah, I was committed. It was got to make it work. I had plans. If this doesn't work, I can start make Nick do only fans, you know, military <laughs> work, that guy. You know, people pay money to watch people him do money. crazy only things. Only guys though do. Yeah. yeah, some weird guys, but you gotta do what you gotta do. Do you think that that would have been more financially beneficial? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Imagine yeah. him and Dan doing only fans <laughs> together. True war vet. Shout out to the podcast with Nick and Dan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Listen, doing only fans. Look, bro, don't make. I've thought about selling my feet picks online. You know how much those people make. I don't know if you're in the target market of feet picks, bro. They, I can I can AI feet picks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't know. I don't know if I, I mean personally, I don't know if I would subscribe to Nick's OnlyFans. No offense. But, no, you're not the type of people. <laughs> yeah, you're not the type of guys, you know. Me. So <laughs> Crutchfield, like you know, those type of guys. <laughs> Let's bring have names lined up. There has not been one positive shout out on this episode. So many people from the St. Louis area got shouted out. Every single one of them has been pretty derogatory. That's how they know we love them. That's true. That's how they know that's we true. love them. It that's I mean, it's no different than actually at the gym. No, you know? it's not. The <laughs> only people, only person we shout out and like talk shit on that I absolutely hate is Bryce. Dude, yeah. Honestly, if there was the an award for the worst person on earth, it would absolutely go to Bryce. Oh, 100%. Yeah. I can't imagine anyone as worse. 
<laughs> as bad of a person as as Bryce, you know? Oh, Bryce. Man. We love you. It's a terrible name. We do. <laughs> we do. You're doing oh, oh, the pod the sound's out. The sound's out on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> he muted us. Cut the video <laughs> off. Cut the feed. <laughs> So um, I just thought I would finish with, as we kind of look forward, you know, we're finishing, I think this podcast will come out uh, January, but uh, for us, this is the end of the year. Um, any kind of big plans, big goals for you guys? Oh, yes, we have a lot of plans. Uh, Brazil? We have a trip coming out to Brazil. I want to m- make sure Nick, Kai Watts, and Josh McKinney will go. Pirata is going, confirmed, 100%. You know, you know how Pirata is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you he's know? down. He came up to me like, I want to go to Brazil. And do Ready Brazil to get in a fist fight Set it up. So I went to Brazil this time, and I went to a gym. I trained everybody there. I made friends who have a place to train. train. It's a pretty cool pr- place. And uh, I, we picked an area. This is not a camp. I'm not uh, setting up a trip for you. I'm going to help my some guys that need help with the visa to get their visas. I'm going to get the Airbnb. We all stay together in the same area. We're going to train jiu-jitsu, eat good food, and compete at Brasileiros. And uh, I was going to take 10 guys. I already have 10 guys sign up, so yeah. I'm going to maybe take 20 guys, 10 more. So I'm going to try to make it. If not, I've already promised, committed. You heard it here first. 2025, I'm going to do the Grand Slam. Oh. Yeah. All Euros, right. Pans, Brasileiros. Let's do it. should yeah. do it. That's pretty Just fun. Just putting out that this Brazil trip is an open invitation to no one. To no one. All right. <laughs> we call you by only the guys. Only like special people a, go. I need you to ask my wife about the Brazil trip. Your wife don't like me. That woman do not like me. So. Nick, I'm going to need you to ask my wife about the Brazil trip. I'm going to need Kyle Watson. Yeah, Kyle, Kyle Watson is the right guy to have mm-hmm. butter up the wives. Yeah. he's a. That's what I need you to ask Kyle Watson to ask Just my wife. don't. Don't. Have him do it when he's had a couple of beers, because then it gets sloppy. Honestly, that's when my wife loves Kyle Watson. Oh, then yeah, perfect. Yeah, he's you know it's when funny. he when he's not making as much sense, you know, <laughs> and he just keeps looking at you, going, "Are you okay? Are you okay? Are you doing good? I gotta pee. <laughs> I gotta pee." We're dude. We're twenty minutes into the podcast, and Kyle Watson hit me with, "I've got to pee. Can we stop the podcast? I've got to pee." That's his Bro, life. it's been twenty minutes. You know, like what do you what do you do on a flight? Like, I don't understand. Oh, hold on. Speak of flights. Do you remember when we competed at Austin and Kyle booked the flights for us? And it was like one in the morning on Spirit Airlines. Bro, and we t- we had <sighs> like three connecting flights to save $40. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I do remember yeah, that. That and, was miserable. And Nick's telling me like, yeah, man, I don't. I get a little nervous on flights, only on the takeoff. I'm like, don't worry, Nick. We only have to take off six times today. <laughs> you know, he's like, by the end of the day, he's like, I don't get nervous on flights yeah, anymore. Like, hey, do you like LA? Because we're going to Austin. We'll yeah. fly down <laughs> like, what are we doing, Kyle? Your gym has 700 members and we're saving $50. That's and it. we could have flown. St. Louis flies directly to Austin. Not on Spirit at one in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, that was that was terrible. If there is something you do not do, you don't let Kyle Watson book your travel. I learned. I learned a lesson there. Mm-hmm. I do not let that. And happen. I'm sure you never let him do it again. Oh no. That was the same point that you and I, um, speaking of negative shout outs, you and I were sponsored by Fuji. Oh, yeah. And we both had the same Fuji backpack that broke the same trip. I was care I was bear <laughs> hugging my bag because I all my stuff was in that bag. Bear hugging it through through at the airport. <laughs> well, actually, we went out to eat too. We walked from the venue to the place, and I had my bag like this, just full of shit, flying all over the place. To be fair, though, you were making fun of me when my bag broke. I, yes, and then your bag Karma broke hit, too, and yeah. it was oh, Fuji. And then they then we were sponsored by them, and then without telling us, they just straight up stopped. Give us any products. Yeah. <laughs> we I email them like, hey, am I still sponsored by you guys? Because I didn't get like the quarterly uh um check. I was like, oh yeah, no, we're not sponsoring athletes anymore. Cool. I have run into this weird disagreement with every company that has ever sponsored me eventually, where we would get into this disagreement where like I would want them to keep sponsoring me and they don't want to keep sponsoring. Dude, me, I've had that know? with so Fuji and then I got with um, gold uh-huh and they're like oh yeah we're gonna give you x amount of dollars every quarter and it was good money mm-hmm. i got one check 
And then the next quarter came around like, well, fuck, I guess I'm not getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was bad. That's why we went and posed Will. St. Louis-based yeah. company. Adam's a stud. We can, good. we can show up at Adam's house if we need dude, to. I will always rep his stuff. He's, he's, he's a good dude. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I like Adam a lot. I just had him on the podcast and talked about uh, all the different stuff that's going on with Impose Will. Definitely growing. Definitely glad to be part of a, a company that actually likes us. Yeah, you know? Awesome. Yeah. Uh, anything you guys want to say to finish? Man, I don't That's know. great. If you want to learn jujitsu, come to Revive. Yeah. Dr- unless Dr- you want to, unless you want to train in like the nicest place in the country, Revive. Granite City, Illinois. Go, all right. You know? Yes. If you, you want to be train. weak in St. Charles, you, you know? want air conditioning, go to Revive. <laughs> <laughs> drink Revive coffee. If you want to be grow a beard, look yeah. like Nick Sanders. If you want to be two hundred pl- pounds plus, just. Roided out huge humans come to revive. Jacked, bro. The All super soldiers, man. That's why I go to revive. It's like, man, this is I this is the most physical training that there is. Everybody there is at least two hundred pounds. I think our gym average has to be two hundred pounds. Yeah. Right and back. six foot two. Yeah, I feel like a midget there. I know. I, I look like a little kid training with all the Revive guys, you know, taking a picture. Well, they keep like on getting bigger. We just had that guy come from another gym. He's like 6'6 six, six or 6'4. Six, He's enormous. Enormous, though, that <sighs> Gracie Baja guy. I'm never going to Revive again. Greg. I'm never going again. So how do you get Revive coffee? Somebody, we've given enough plugs we to it. come to the gym or you can buy online at Re- uh, revivebjj.com. You can come to Revive and buy it, and I'm going to bring some to Josh so he can sell a head nod for me. What? Yeah, I just decided just right now. All I'm right. Sweet. Then. Why isn't it head nod coffee, but then? He wants the money uh, up front. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, not, it's a Revive brand. I think it looks better than head nod for coffee. Yeah, I like that. Okay? I like that. But if for I'm selling gonna, drugs. If I'm, gonna, gonna, <laughs> <laughs> if I'm going to start a backyard fighting <laughs> league, bare knuckle, I'll call head nod. Okay. I think that's probably that's probably right. pretty sense, good. Right? Yeah. All right, guys. Thank you so much right, for being on the show. Yeah, right. thank you. Thank you, Josh, for having <laughs> us. And that is the episode. Thank you guys for checking this one out. Like I said, um, I will tell you guys where we're at with the uh, how to master any position in six weeks course and with the beta testers that I've been having. Um, and so I will, yeah, mention that. But um, before we get into that, uh, just make sure that if you guys have not been checking out the YouTube channel, this is the time to get in. It's the time to get subscribed. We have been putting out so much content, probably two different technique videos a week um, that are full length videos and then just a ton of different shorts, just a ton of things to help you get better at jujitsu more efficiently and more effectively. And it's just totally free on YouTube, you can go to the Josh McKinney BJJ YouTube channel if you have not been checking that out. Um, but then also, I told you guys that I have been working on in my own jujitsu and that um, I have been working on as a product the, um, the, the course master any position in six weeks and this is uh actually the first course that i ever developed i i developed it um i actually remember writing it down in a notebook on our way to vacation one year our family vacation we were on a plane and i just had my headphones in and i was thinking about what i had been doing and how i could kind of systemize it to help my students get better faster and um I did it and it worked and um, you know now fast forward years and years of us just really making this method of culture in our gym Um, and just like uh, how we kind of train of of, you know having focuses and um, being able to get good very quickly Um, but uh, I decided to turn that into a podcast and turn it into a premium podcast And so that won't be available for a while, but I kind of needed some people because I've never had it in podcast format. I needed some people to go through the course um, and what we would kind of do is document their journey through the course and see if they not only get better at what we choose to focus on, um, but they actually can start to create habits of getting really, really good 
at uh, Jiu Jitsu in general without needing their coach's advice, without needing my advice, without needing anyone's advice. And so um, really just want to teach you that skill of Jiu Jitsu progression. And um, as it goes right now, I saw two spots of the four that were available for that beta tester. And so, um, yeah, if anybody wants to get in, you have to make the decision, I think, in the next two weeks because uh, I have everybody that has paid set up to like like go by March. And so um, if we're going to knock it out and let people be able to jump in on this Master in a Position in Six Weeks course, um, I think it'll probably come out in the summer. Uh, yeah, I have two spots available. So if you guys want to get in on that, you absolutely can. And um, the best way to do that, just send me an email, josh at simplifyingjujitsu.com or send me a message on Instagram, the Josh McKinney, and I will be happy to I will be happy to, to kind of tell you guys more information, tell you guys pricing on it, and um, answer any questions. And maybe you guys could be my last two beta testers on this course. And um, maybe you can just get better than everybody at your gym and smash everybody and then become a mat bully and then i'll have a really good segue to start to focus on my podcast content about how to deal with mat bullies and so um yeah we can we can do all that but we can only accomplish it if we get two more beta testers to work on this course at this point i feel like it's time to uh to end this episode i've been been rambling for a little too long today um but uh, next week we have, I'm not totally sure, it might be a Devin Prada interview, it might be another solo episode. I think it's going to be a question and answer, but regardless, in the next two weeks on the podcast, when the Devin Prada episode comes out, it is absolutely 10 out of 10. And um, I even ask Devin... Um, just for you guys that are still listening after I told you to stop listening to this episode I even asked Devin at the end of that episode towards the end of that episode about the Nashville Open incident and um, that was the first time we've ever actually discussed what happened and so um, for those of you who have been loyal to the podcast you know what I'm talking about and so there is a little bit of drama but just so much good content on training and really balancing how to be a, a hard or how to do hard training and how to not do hard training it's funny because he gives me credit to certain things but then I'm asking him questions about like oh really tell me more about that and he's like yeah it's like you say on the podcast and I'm like I never said that but yeah yeah let's keep let's keep going on this <laughs> let me keep learning too and so it's really fun um just that dynamic uh, of that episode we just got to discuss some ideas uh in depth and so i think you guys will really like that and now i will officially stop rambling um hope you guys have a great day hope you guys get better at your jujitsu with focusing we talked about it all last week and then I hope that today's episode helps you guys suck just a little bit less at jujitsu. Have a great day, guys.